We are back. I'm Cheryl Cohen, founder and president of Arthritis Consumer Experts. We are in the hashtag See Arthritis booth with Dr. John Esdale. We couldn't be happier to have him here with us this morning. Um, he is sort of in, at least in many patients' views and, and researchers' views and, and colleagues, uh, kind of a god of rheumatology, I'm going to say. He's been around for a long, long time, has a vibrant um, practice, a vibrant research agenda. He is the scientific director of Arthritis Research Canada. He's also a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia um, and is a force to be reckoned with in the arthritis research world. So we're so happy, in a good way, by the way. Um, uh, we are uh, so happy to have you with us this morning. Thank you for taking time to join us, John. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I don't recognize myself, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> Just take it all in, okay? I'm going to take it all in. Okay, good. Um, we want to talk to you about a couple of things this morning, and um, given your, your the, the sort of diversity of your own research and the research of teams that you're leading, we want to talk about two things in particular. One is the team that you're leading for a grant called Precision, and Precision, I, I know, being a part of the grant team, um, is really focusing on uh, a number of different yep. chronic diseases or conditions that have one common element, and that's inflammation. Uh, and it was, you, you were, won this grant as part of a, a call for proposals by the CIHR that focused on inflammation as, as, a, as a theme. So tell us about this, this team grant, um, John, if you can. Tell us what diseases it's looking at and, and what things you've sort of uncovered in, in the first couple of years of the grant, the life of the grant. It's, uh, it's a very uh, intriguing uh, topic to me. It's one that I've been fascinated by for a very long time. And the enigma that I first realized was that people with rheumatoid arthritis don't live as long as people without rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the death certificates, there's no increase in death from rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So why is that? And the hypothesis of this grant is that inflammation, the inflammation caused by rheumatoid arthritis, by other diseases like lupus, like Sjogren's, like psoriatic arthritis, like ankylosing spondylitis, like gout, uh, and even like osteoarthritis, uh, cause complications. Right. These complications are what goes on the death certificate, and they are heart attacks, strokes, clots in the leg, clots going to the lung, fractured hips, terrible infections, some uncommon types of cancer, and also uh, diabetes, sugar diabetes, and chronic lung disease. So that that's what ends up on your death certificate. Right. A uh, hypothesis is that inflammation, that these things occur, and it's caused by inflammation. For most of the diseases I've listed, many of those different outcomes like heart attacks, strokes, and so on, uh, we're starting to show are uh, increased uh, in these diseases to a major extent. That in and of itself is interesting that inflammation is doing all of these terrible things, but of course, if you're a patient, you want to know, well, thanks a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what am I going to do about yeah. it? Um, so uh, there is a large team on this grant. There's about 30 people, and as you said, you know, I'm the leader, but the, the leader sort of sits on the horse in front, and if the <laughs> grant doesn't get funded, you shoot the leader. Um, <laughs> and, but otherwise, uh, there are a lot of very bright uh, uh, young scientists who are working uh, 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 more than 30 and a very bright uh, consumer core led by you uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we're very fortunate to have giving us the patient perspective on every aspect uh, uh, of this project. But our interest is if inflammation is causing these bad complications to happen and we control inflammation, yeah do they go away? And we're starting to find evidence. We're really at the beginning of the phase two. Can we alter uh, these outcomes? And uh, some of the scientists have 
uh, Diane Lacai, Antonio Avina are very involved in showing that powerful treatments, uh, say for rheumatoid arthritis is the best example of methotrexate or some of the new biologics like anti-TNFs, actually prolong your life by about seven years, not a bad thing, mm -hmm. and seem to almost eradicate and perhaps do eradicate the increase in heart attacks. So what this is saying is early intervention for inflammatory disease and turning the inflammation off may stop a host of unfortunate things happening to our patients. Yeah. Do you know, I am going to underscore that point, John, because people in the public, patients like me, um, we hear a lot at ACE, uh, people email us and we're on the phone talking on social media and they say, oh, my, you know, my rheumatologist, all they want to do is push pills at me. All they want to yeah. do is prescribe medicines. Mm -hmm. And I want our audience to draw the direct link between what you just said and, that, and those prescriptions because it is the way we know now to treat these severe types of autoimmune disease and that our lives and our, the longevity of, that, of those lives is directly related to, to those medications that are suppressing the inflammation. That that is in part going to help deal with the complications that you're talking about in this big grant. That that's where the research right. is, is pointing the way. And it ties into the theme of the conference this year, which is precision medicine. It actually does help us get towards that more individualized approach and a one medicine for me may not be the right medicine for the next person. I certainly, you know, I, I see patients and that's very much one of the things they say to me, well, I'm really, really worried about the side effects. Right. I went to my pharmacist and they said the most terrible things can happen with these drugs, um, which is largely a fiction. But what I tell them is that the side effects from not getting treated is infinitely worse than this, any side effect from these drugs. Yeah. And the, you know, they do require monitoring and they do need you to have blood tests perhaps and things like that. But we know that un, if we just, you have rheumatoid arthritis, we do nothing, we give you some aspirin, we put you on even prednisone, make you feel better, that you're gonna have at least a 50% increase in heart attacks. And you know, heart attacks is the most common cause of death for people, so you up that 50%. 50% increase in strokes, a dramatic increase in hip fractures, 20% yeah. of people with a hip fracture die um, within a matter of weeks, um, and so on and so forth, and yeah. diabetes and lung disease. Now, because treatments can prevent these and prolong life, uh, the latest uh, research from uh, Diane Lacai on rheumatoid arthritis is that these uh, drugs can prolong your life by at least seven years, it looks like. That's a real amount of life. That's a huge amount of life. You know, it's uh, incredible. Absolutely. And I know 30 years ago almost now when I was diagnosed and I did my reading in a book, not on the mm -hmm. internet actually. It was hard mm -hmm. to get information on the internet back, right. back when I was diagnosed. Um, I learned that 12 years was off my lifespan, my expected lifespan, and I thought, holy crow, mm -hmm. that's not very good. And now what you're talking about is these things that you're learning through precision, if we control inflammation, I get seven of those 12 years back, Th well, theoretically. No, getting, I think you're getting... More than that. No. I think the 12 years became seven because of methotrexate, which I came see. in in the early 80s. Okay. And I think that had an impact. Okay. And took the 12 pre-methotrexate to probably around something like seven. Okay. Um, I don't think we're that accurate, but it looks like if you looked at the curves that if this was normal people and this was people with RA yeah. over time, you know, with increasing deaths, it's done that. So we're getting equal to we're, the non-RA right. population, You're, for example. That's what it appears. Wow, very fascinating. Thank you for explaining that to the audience. It's um, the, this precision team is incredible. They're looking at a number of different things: gout, 
Um, there's a huge database registry of patients now that Dr. Mm -hmm. Avenia mm -hmm. is doing a pile of work with, uh, looking at large data sets and trying to um, find the cookie crumbs, you know, the, the path through the data t that leads to real answers to people uh, like me and many of our viewers. So thank you so much for, for describing that. Um, I want to uh, take some time with you, given your expertise in the field of osteoarthritis, which is the largest burden of arthritis in the world of all types of arthritis, particularly true, obviously, here in Canada. Um, so many myths exist about arthritis. Absolutely. And about osteoarthritis in particular. Mm -hmm. So if I asked you, what are the five myths? Bust those for us. So this is a, a myth-busting mm -hmm. question. Myth-busting. You get five. If you want six or seven, you can take them. So osteoarthritis is a result of aging. Now, we know that there are 90-year-olds with no osteoarthritis, so it's not just aging. Okay. Um, it's not just a disease of the elderly. If you are um, on the Canadian ski team and tear your ACL, you have probably a 90% chance of having osteoarthritis within 15 years. So uh, injury. Injury, injury leads to osteoarthritis in the joint. Certainly in the knee, hip, and hand. Okay. Um, and uh, preventing injury will prevent osteoarthritis, okay. we believe. Um, so myth number one, it's not age. It's not age. Okay. I think the second myth is there's nothing that can be done. And when I started in rheumatology, as you said, you know, in the last century <laughs> and a long time ago, um, with rheumatoid Sorry. arthritis, there is only, it was only gold. So we actually would diagnose rheumatoid arthritis and say, we're not going to do anything for a year. And the rationale was, well, we only have one drug. Let's hold it back on it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it seems pretty crazy today when we now say, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you should see a rheumatologist in two weeks, and you should be started in on... At that visit, basically. At that visit. Yeah. Um, it's really an arthritic emergency. Mm -hmm. um, so what we say now with osteoarthritis is, well, there's not much you can do, so why do anything? You know, eventually we'll do surgery. And um, I think that's totally untrue, and it reminds me very much of what we used to say about rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So that uh, there was a study done by uh, uh, Yolanda Siebert and a, a, a brilliant pharmacist, Carl O'Mara, who's now in New Zealand, where they had pharmacists diagnose osteoarthritis of the knee really, really early. And people, it was a randomized trial, and they were randomized to talking with the pharmacist, getting the drug therapy straightened out, having a little physiotherapy intervention, understanding what the causes were, um, and followed up for six months. Um, they were checked by a physician to make sure that all of this was correct. Um, None of them had been diagnosed with osteoarthritis by their uh, family, family physician, physician yeah. but all had osteoarthritis of the knee. And what staggered us was that these people lost weight and got fit and their pain went away. Wow. Um, we were so disbelieving because people with osteoarthritis don't lose weight and don't get fit and don't get better. We repeated the study. We did it again. Because you weren't sure of the we, result. We, we couldn't believe the yeah, result. Yeah. You know, there's a one in 20 chance with all of these things that you're going to think it's real when it isn't, yeah. and the statistics of it. And so Carla repeated it, and again, it was definitive. Um, so what we understood from that is these people who were a little younger had been diagnosed very early, picked up very early, and then given relatively simple mandate. You, we're going to teach you how to get get fit, yeah. and we're going to teach you how to lose some weight, we're going to change your drugs around so they're less dangerous, and it was shown to be very cost effective, cheap, 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 and made a big difference to people's so lives. So myth number two busted, something can be done about OA. Especially of the knee, all right? So of we know knee, what yeah. to do about the knee, I okay. think. Okay, okay. Um, that's the one we have our closest handle on. Okay, what about three? Myth number three. Myth number three, I would think, 
is, it's really, it's not a myth. It's just we don't know what causes hip osteoarthritis. It's different from knee. We know that... As a disease, it's different? What you see on the x-ray yeah. is the same. Okay. The pathology looks the same, but for example, if you are overweight, if you're obese, not okay. overweight, but okay. if you're obese, you probably increase your risk, depending on how obese, 400% to 700% of getting knee osteoarthritis. Um, obviously, a significant number. Yeah. The impact on the hip is minimal. Hmm. There's probably a little effect, but not a lot. So the hip is different. Guess what joint is the other joint is that gets osteoarthritis if you're obese? The hand. The hand. Yeah. Oh, isn't that crazy? Yeah. So there are things, this osteoarthritis is not just the weight. Yeah. There are things released probably into the circulation that are doing it. So it's not just being overweight. It may be a consequence of being overweight. Okay. But um, things are more complicated than we realized before. But in the hip, it's been somewhat of a black box. Yes, weight may be a little. Yes, trauma. Uh, yes, certain occupations, a lot of very heavy physical lifting. Yeah. Um, but we're now, uh, we have a, a group, uh, a large group, uh, using x-rays and sophisticated polling techniques, MRIs, and even things beyond MRIs that will tell us the health of the cartilage and looking at what is called femoroacetabular impingement, but that long word basically means there's a bump on your hip that is likely causing damage to the hip very slowly over time and causing the osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited by this uh, discovery, finding, yeah. this finding. Others have found it, but we're doing it in a whole population and trying to link uh, the two. Um, and I think this is potentially very important yeah. because then the question becomes, when does that bump occur? Should one be doing anything? Should they be counseled not to do certain types right, of activity right. and therefore not get So the, the intervention is high impact, low cost. It's basically don't do this or do this. It could very well be that simple. Yeah, yeah. We don't know it's that simple, sure. but it could be. Sure. What about uh, myths four and five? Well, I think, you know, the big myth with osteoarthritis is really um, four and five is that you can't do anything. Um, so if you are getting, I'll, I'll tell you the, the diagnostic question. If you're sitting out there in the audience, you're over 40 years of age, and sometime in your lifetime you've had pain, stiffness, aching, or discomfort in or about your knee for most days on a month, and if you have also had pain, aching, stiffness, or discomfort in that same knee in the last year, um, you have an 87% chance of having very early osteoarthritis of the knee. Your x-rays, uh, even a research-grade x-ray would be normal 50% of wow. the time, but your MRI would be abnormal. Um, and it's a warning sign. Uh, it means you've got to start your You've got to start building up your quads. Got to get you probably have become a little sedentary. So number one is strengthening, trying to do things to strengthen the joint around the um, joint. Yeah, the joints are really supported by the muscles. Right. So muscle strengthening tends to support the joint better, keep it sort of more stable, right. and reduce progression. We know right. it reduces progression. Right. Um, so that's pretty. You know, th this myth of that you can't do anything is, I think, something we have to get well, rid of. Well, you've just busted it. You've just, I don't know you've just busted but, that myth. But, and I think, too, that the, it's, a, um, that it's a, just a wear and tear disease. There's well, a disease process going on. One quick point yeah. is that for young people by 14 to, say, age 20, who are involved in a lot of competitive sports, we believe 25% of knee osteoarthritis is due to that. Proper rehab, you know, you're playing soccer, you're injured, you've got a swollen knee, you should not be going back on the field. You should be getting physio, and you should not be going back on the field until yeah. you're fully rehabbed. Yeah. Uh, because we believe that is 25% of knee osteoarthritis. Yeah, fascinating. And, you know, 
to, to know that we can do something, intervene at a young age, exactly, is is massive because the problems don't roll up and become bigger and bigger and bigger as we age. Thank you so much for busting those myths for us and for telling us about precision. We're just going to go to the audience really quickly to see if we have any questions, and then we'll let you get on about Thanks. what we know is a very busy day. Thank you. Anita? There is a question about research funding. So why is research funding for arthritis so important? And how is funding for arthritis like compared to other disease groups? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, arthritis is not glamorous. Um, I think... Uh, what? Yeah, it's not glamorous. <laughs> you know, cancer is glamorous, HIV is glamorous, and heart disease is glamorous. But uh, for obvious reasons that we all understand, arthritis has not been glamorous in the past. I think it's becoming more glamorous, but it's still getting very little research funding. Glamorous in the sense that, you know, all kidding aside, glamorous in the sense that it's not captured the attention right. of the healthcare system or funders of research. Right. Yeah. So that the general approach is we don't care about our Right, things. right. It's not important. Now, um, I think that is changing, but uh, research, if you compared, say, uh, research funding for arthritis to neurologic disease to heart disease to cancer to, to HIV to it's, it's, all of it's, it's tiny it's three percent so it's ten percent uh, of the population have osteoarthritis uh, and if you put all arthritis together it's about sixteen percent but arthritis gets three percent of the research so there's funding. a big gap there's between big gap. burden and research spending why is research important because I do believe that we are making, with this limited money, we are being hugely successful yeah. in improving the lives of people with arthritis, and I believe we could be a lot more successful. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, the creation uh, almost 20 years ago of Arthritis Research Canada, and now you have centers in Vancouver, Calgary, Shur uh, Laval. Laval. Uh, you know, that you've been very successful at bringing young people into arthritis research who can compete for those research funding um, pools, I think has been really, really important. So thank you for taking that leadership have, on. It was a big vision, and I know you've got an event coming up in May um, called the Arthritis Soiree, mm -hmm. and it's always a ton of fun. Um, I usually go, and I try to stay out of trouble, but it's lots of fun. It's a silent auction. It's a live auction. There's always incredible, some sort of artistic performance. What, tell us what it is this year. It's, um, this is our a, a, a primary uh, fundraising event. It's in Vancouver on, in the rooftop hotel and the... Uh, of Hotel the, Vancouver. Hotel Vancouver. Yeah. And the star yeah. is Colin James. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. It's, it's wonderful that he's doing this for us. Thank uh, you, Colin. Yeah, thank you, Colin. It's, uh, it's really... Uh, you know, he's so busy and that he's taking the time to do this is spectacular. Um, so we're looking forward to the evening. Yeah. It's really always fun. Just Google Arthritis Soiree. You can buy a ticket. Uh, and I promise you, you'll have a great evening. And it's not too late. And um, all of the proceeds, all of them. Go to research. Go to research. Every single penny. Nothing goes to pay for pens or paper clips or no. computers or things of that nature. So it, it goes directly into the research work that you're leading there. So um, support if you can. Uh, you can learn more about it by visiting www.arthritisresearch.ca. It's very prominently placed on your website. Um, we just want to thank you so thank much. You. There may be more questions, but we're, I, I think we're going to cut it off there okay. and we'll answer them uh, via Facebook um, unless there's something absolutely pressing, Anita. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll let you go. Uh, we know how busy you are, Dr. Esdale. We're very thankful that you came in. No, and thank con you. Congratulations. You do a great job. You do a great job. Getting, you stay, you getting stay news put. Out there. We're not letting you oh. go yet. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Come back soon. We're going to be interviewing Dr. Mary DeVera.